Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for your love. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you because of your anointing that is available to teach and preach your word in such a way that everyone will have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, come into a deeper place in Christ Jesus, and receive solution and practical wisdom for daily living. Thank you because of the utterance available by the Spirit of God, so that we can speak freely the mysteries of Christ. Thank you because your anointing is upon this mortal clay, that we can speak clearly the divine mysteries in Christ Jesus. Well, thank you because no one that comes into the service will go back the same again. Once again, personally, I'm grateful because of adding a year of strength, of life, of health, of progress. Looking back at my journey, I'm broadly able to say, if the Lord had not been on our side, where would we have been? But thank God that he that watches over Israel, neither sleeps nor slumber. For the Lord is our helper, the Lord is our keeper. Thank you for being our keeper. Thank you for showing me and our spiritual family mercy. We are grateful, oh God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Please. Amen. Let's go into God's word. So this month we've been talking about the word of God. We've been talking about the word. And let me tell you something. One of the things I wanted to brag about our church, you can be like, oh, our church is nice, it's cool, music is fantastic. I wanted to brag about our church, that our church has word. Yes. Not just word. You know, there's some churches you preach, mm, mm, uh. what did you learn? Ah, the pastor, the yarn. Powerful. What did you learn? I can't remember. Because at the end of the day, it's a lot of high sounding words that have no impact. It takes a lot of wisdom and grace for someone to teach the word. You leave the service. I can be like, wow, I actually remember one, two, three, four, five. And on Monday, I can apply that. How many of you during the week, you hear something I said in church, I want to apply? Does it happen to you? Exactly. In fact, some of you use them in conversations to your friends. Is that not true? You know, one time I preached a message and there was a radio show. And um, one illustration I used in church, the person now said in the radio, one of our choir leaders, at least he said, Pastor, well, like, this person attends our first ah, He said, you could tell that he was in the service, but he couldn't say it like you. But he was trying to say, for example, he was trying to describe. But, but what I'm saying is that we must brag on the fact that we attend a Christ-centered, Bible-believing church. You know why? When you attend a Bible-believing church, you'll be apt to deceive. You will not be going to churches they say you put kerosene in your, in your mouth. Neither do we need to put powder on someone's face and ask them to wake up from the dead. No, we don't need to do that. The word is enough. You, we love the word. We love the word. So, so I'm, I'm grateful because people that look for a miracle will keep going around. And as a believer, you should not believe for signs and wonders. Signs and wonders should follow you. The Bible says, this signs shall follow them that what? Believe. You should not be the one looking for signs and wonders. Signs and wonders should be one following you. Glory to God. All right, let's get into the word of God. James chapter 1. So I'm talking about the word today becoming a, the transformative power of the word of God. We're meant to have a differences in the fourth service, but I'm just going to focus it on this. Then next month, we'll start our full series again, which is dealing with emotional healing. I'm going to focus on that next month. So James chapter 1 in verse 21. And by the way, um, today we are feeding 1,500 families in Ikorodu. Next week, we are filling another 1,000 families in Aja. Praise the Lord. We will keep feeding and helping people as the Lord has given us the ability. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. James chapter 1 verse 21. He says this. So we're talking about the word of God. We're talking about the word of God. So um, I said one of the things. So let me just lay some foundation. How do, you, how do you really know how to study the Bible? Number one, for you to want to study the Bible very well, you need a study, Bible study plan. Yeah. If you read the Bible randomly, you can never know the Bible. And if you read the Bible randomly, you're going to get up more confused than you not reading it at all. So you cannot, this cannot be your Bible study plan. Let me show you what it is. I have the word, word, word Father. I just open like this. You, that can be your Bible study plan. And if you do that, you will notice, if you use a physical Bible, you will notice that I used to do that before, I can tell you. 
every time you do that, you open the book of Psalms. Yes or no? You know why? No, so I say God speaks through Psalms. It doesn't speak through Psalms. Psalm is the center of the Bible. It's the center book of the Bible. So when you open in the middle, you just open to Psalms. So if you want to know how to study your Bible, you must have a very good, you must have a very good Bible study plan. You must have a, a very good Bible study plan. You must have a very good Bible study plan. The second thing is this. If you're serious with the Bible study, you must have a place to write the things you learn. Because that's the way they stay. You must learn to write the things you learn. That's the way they stay. So when you read the Bible, how do I understand the Bible? So the first thing is that there, there are laws of Bible interpretation. Number one, everything is said within a context. So when you read the Bible, everything is said within what? A context. So for example, um, let me give you... Um, uh, Oh, wow. There's so many things to... I'm just trying to see something that people say that is not right. So, people say things like, you can't know what God wants. You, you can't know what God has in store for you. Someone says, you can't know God what has in store for you. And they will quote 1 Corinthians chapter 2. That the Bible says, eyes have not seen. What does it say? Ears has not heard. What? Let's go back there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Just go back. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. Let's just use this as an example. Glory to God. Let, let's use an example. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. Hallelujah. Praise God. I love the word of God. I love the word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. Yeah, see what it says. As it is written, what has happened? Eyes has not seen, neither has head heard, neither has he entered in things. So they say, you cannot know what God has for you because eyes have not seen. So if they read this and they say that, is that true? No, but that's what it says now. Read now. Eyes have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has he entered in the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for what? So that means I do not know. But now, so someone will say that, you see, this is why we need to go and consult a prophet because you don't know what God wants for your life. But the way to interpret the Bible is to read the pretext, what is said before, and what the post-text, what is said after. Look at verse 10. Just look at verse 10. Oh. Look at verse 10. So that you can see it in full meaning. But, but God has what? Did you see that? If you read verse 9 alone, it said it was not revealed. But it was said in time past, eyes had not seen, ears had not heard, neither has it been revealed. Because he was quoting that scripture from the book of Isaiah. So it was saying in the Old Testament, he didn't have the Holy Spirit. So eyes had not seen, ears had not heard, neither has it been revealed to man what God had in store for them that love him. He said, but now that when the New Testament bought God has revealed them to us. So, where is the error? Once you don't read the context. So, you must read things, break context, pretext, post-text, and context. That's how you interpret the Bible. So, when someone says, gives you one big scripture, pass, you say, thank you. Can I read three verses before? Can I read three verses under? So, just check what you're saying, if it's true. Someone say, Hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. So someone says that, um, what do you call it? Um, that the gift of the Holy Spirit is not for everybody. Mm. Okay. Okay. Let's read some verses before. Let's read some verses on that so that we can understand all the things. Someone says only 144,000 people are going to heaven. Have you heard that story before? Okay, that's great. Let's just read some verses before. Let's some, so I heard that there's a place, I know there's a place that says 14,000 people are going to heaven. But after that verse, the Bible says, and I heard the sound of a great multitude which no man was able to number. How come you just ignore the few verses after and stick with one? So when people want to do Bible deception, what they do is that they stick with one, person, one place and ignore the other things that the Bible is saying. Glory to God. I said glory to God. Hallelujah. So, so that's the first principle. The second thing is that this is how you understand the Bible. Is the Bible speaking literally or is it using the figure of speech? Is the Bible, this is how you understand the Bible. Is the Bible speaking what 
literally or using a figure of speech so if i say to someone um if i say to someone look at look at spiral he's as black as charcoal question is spiral as black as charcoal is spiral as is, is spiral charcoal but what i'm saying is a simile i'm trying to use something to describe what i'm really saying that he's dark skin is that not true that's what i'm saying so the bible also contains literal statements and statements that what a figure of speech for example the bible says um sorry english says um what do you call it um um what i can say this also and say um victor is as bold as lion is he a lion no what i'm using is a simile a simile is a figure of speech a simile is a figure of speech that, re- that directly compares two different things using the word like or as in a simile the reason for the comparison is because you are trying to emphasize certain qualities. So when you read the Bible also, you need to check, is this a literal thing or is this a figure of speech? And the reason I'm saying so is that today and last week we used something. The word of God was compared to something. It was compared to some things. And I want to read those things to you. So when you read, you know, I mean, just right there once you don't understand the english of the word you will not interpret the bible correctly so let's read now i said all of that to read this to you joshua chapter sorry james chapter 1 verse 21 all right are we ready no no that's weak now you ready come on it's my birthday you can do better than that are you ready exactly praise god thank you thank you glory to god that's from a pastor she used anything to preach praise god James chapter 1 verse 21. He says this, Wherefore lay aside all filthiness and superfluity with thee of naughtiness and receive with what? Meekness. Receive with meekness what? The engrafted word. He said receive with meekness the engrafted word. I love what he says. He says, receive with me. He says, one, he's telling us what the posture is towards the word. He says, when you hear the word of God, submit to it. Be humble about it. Be meek about it. Some people, when you say the Bible says it, they're looking for how to defend their actions. They're looking for how to say, this is wrong. This is what I think. No, no, no. He says that, receive the meekness and grafted word. There are two kinds of people that do wrong. There's the one person that does wrong. When you say the Bible says this, the person is humble. And he's saying, oh God, I receive your mercy. I receive your grace. I receive your forgiveness. But there's another person that when the person does wrong, when you say the Bible says this, well, I don't care because you don't understand what I'm going through. And one of them is like David. Every time David did something that was wrong, David was quick to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Every time Saul did something that was wrong, Saul was quick to say, you don't understand what made me do it. He was quick to defend himself. So the Bible is saying that our response towards the word must that we must what? Receive the word with meekness. And I said this earlier on. I said the word of God is not a buffet, it's a la carte. What does that mean? What does it mean the word of God is not a buffet? The word of God is not what you come to the table and you're picking and say, mm, when, it comes to, when it comes to prosperity, I take that one. When it comes to healing, I take that one. Then when it comes to decent modesty, I don't take that one. Uh-uh. The word of God is not, it's not a buffet. Everything in the word you need to do and believe. The word of God is a la carte. You say, uh, okay, let's look at the word of god yeah 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 yeah, yeah. oh wow on, on, on protection i received that one when it comes to prayer ah no 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 i don't take prayer when it comes to attending the church regularly no no i don't take that seriously no the word does not give you the option of saying choose this and leave this it's not a multiple choice option no everything you must answer and the reason why i'm saying so is this we are in a generation where people are doing multiple choice questions with the word of God and saying, with this, I will do that. With that, I will do this. See, that's not how it works. The word of God is not, bu- it's not buffet. It's a la carte. Let's say you come to church and you're struggling with pornography and masturbation and you're here teaching on pornography and masturbation. What do you do? You don't go like, um, ah, now wow that, that one go hard though right? please oh please please god i beg you know and say that the reason why is that i'm already trying not to commit adultery or fornication i'm just touching myself or watching pornography that should that that's okay you know that's not the word of god the word of god is that if god has a problem with it even if i'm doing that is wrong then i want to change my mind i want to repent i don't want to defend my wrongdoing i want to repent 
Glory to God. I said glory to God. You come to church and we begin to talk about godly dressing and modesty in dressing and saying that, you know, there's, a, there's certain things as a man or a woman you shouldn't wear because those things can be, you know, those things do not represent the value of Christ. You can't be like, I beg, I beg, I beg, I beg, I beg. I beg God looks at the heart. Oh, you see the thing now? God looks at the heart. Oh. You bring another scripture to justify your wrongdoing because, because you're trying to say something. You're trying to defend it. Listen to me. When you grow in Christ, some things must also grow. The length of your skirt. Praise God. Yeah. Praise God. Sometimes when I see some ladies, I just feel that some fashions are fashioned against me. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm like, I'm like, wow, that fashion is what fashioned against me. Because there's no way one can survive some things. And I tell myself, no fashion or weapon that is fashion against me shall prosper. When you come into Christ, some things must... So when they speak about dressing, don't be like, well, you know, this and this, this is my opinion. No, the word of God is not buffet. It's a la carte. Everything in the word of God is what you must do. So let's look at what the word of God says. James chapter 1 verse 20. James chapter 1. James chapter 1 verse 20, 20, 22. He says this, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. That's the tendency of when you hear the word every time and you don't do it, you don't make a change, you begin to deceive yourself. He says this, but for if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, it's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth the same way and straight away he forgetteth the man of man he was. So let's look at here. Here, but the, the writer, which is James, introduced a concept that the word of God is like a mirror. Can I have the mirror? The word of God is like a mirror. Let me have the mirror. The word of God is like what? A mirror. Look at him and say, the word of God is like a mirror. Oh, that's powerful. The word of God is like a mirror. The word of God is like a mirror. Now, now, what, when you look at mirror, you see something on the other side. Yes or no? So what was this say when he said the word of God is my real? He said the word of God has something it needs to show you. He says, For he beholded himself and goeth his way, and straightway he forgeted what manner of man he was. Look at verse 25. Verse 25, look at this. It says, Look at what it calls the word of God. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty. Watch this now. The word of God is a mirror, but it's not the natural mirror. The mirror of the word of God is called the perfect law of liberty. There are different kinds of mirrors. There's a natural mirror. For example, this is the house mirror. You look at it and the mirror shows you exactly who you are. It shows you who you are. If you have spots, you see the spots. If you have wrinkles, you see the wrinkles. It shows who you are. That's the natural mirror. But there's another kind of mirror called the magnifying glass. Do you know the magnifying glass? The magnifying glass, if you have a small pimples and you put the magnifying glass on it, it will make it look very big because it's a magnifying glass. But the word of God is not a natural mirror. It's not a magnif magnifying glass. It's called the perfect mirror. Why is it the perfect mirror? Because in God's word, when you look at God's word, this is powerful. You don't see who you are. Your fault is not magnified. You know what you see? You see yourself in your perfected glory. Oh my goodness. I said, oh my goodness. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. When you look at the mirror, and when I say look at the mirror, the mirror is not like, you know, when I say look at the mirror, it means when you read the word of God, what you see, God's word doesn't, it talks about you from your perfected state. Second Corinthians 3 verse 18. Somebody say hallelujah. It's so powerful. Second Corinthians 3 verse 18. Oh wow. We're looking to the mirror. We're looking to the mirror. He says this. Let's read what to go. But we all with what? Open faces beholding as in a glass. What? He says when we behold the glass. We see the glory of God. What does that mean? When I look into the mirror of God's word. What I see is myself in the glory of God. What does that mean? Here am I. I'm still dealing with my addiction to cocaine. I'm still dealing with my addiction to masturbation. But when I look into my in the mirror. I don't see the one that is struggling. I see the one that is free. Here am I. I'm still dealing with some kind of health issues. When I look into the mirror, I don't see the one that has a health issue. I see the one that is health is perfected. He says this. He says, with 
we all with an open face beholding as in the glass the glory of God. So the mirror of God's word is this. When I look into the word of God, I don't see myself the way I am. I see myself the way God has designed me to be. Oh, glory to God. So guess what? When someone says I am depressed, look into the mirror. Why? When you look into the mirror, the one you, you will see yourself, but you don't see yourself with a depression. You see yourself full of joy because the mirror doesn't show you the way you are. It shows you the way God has made you full of glory someone say hallelujah someone say hallelujah someone say hallelujah someone say hallelujah look at him and say look into the mirror it's very powerful it says as we look into the mirror as we look into the mirror the question is that do you go out and look into the mirror most of you here this morning, you look into the mirror. But do you look into your spiritual mirror? The reason why you are so conscious of all your challenges is that you don't remember who you are. You have not looked into your mirror. Can I say something to you? If you will not leave your house every morning until you see a mirror, how can you live your life every morning without seeing the mirror of God's word? Because the mirror of God's word tells you who you are. It tells you that you are bold. It tells you you are righteous. It tells you you are confident. It tells you you are anointed. It tells you you are favored. It tells you all of these things. Glory to God. Look at him and say, look into the mirror. Very powerful. Thank you. Look into the mirror. How do you see your marriage? Is it based on what a blog says? Based on what Insta blog says? Or you see from the mirror? How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself based on what others call you or you see from the mirror? The question is that it's time for you to what? Look into the mirror. Look into the mirror. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. I said hallelujah. I say hallelujah. When I look into me, what do I find? Number one, this is what happens to me. God's word reveals who I am. So for example, when I listen to people, people can tell me that I'm a nobody. I'm not worth much. No, but nothing great happens to me. That's okay. When I look into the mirror, the winner tells me that I'm a big deal. That I'm God's best. That God cares about me. That I'm the, what do you call it? I'm engraved upon the what? On the palm of his hands. That I'm the apple of his eyes. It's before you that you think I have no value. Before him I have value. The problem is that the only mirror you look at is the mirror that condemns you. You don't look at the mirror that shows you your perfection. Begin to look at the mirror that shows your perfection. So that you will live that way. Someone say hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. Then the most powerful thing is this. This is the most powerful thing. Let's read that 2 Corinthians 3.18 again. Are you ready? Let's read. One to go. Okay, let's read. Is that okay? Can we read now? Okay. One to go. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the spirit of the Lord. Wow. Watch this now. How do I, how do I change? The word change there is metamorphon. The word change is what? Metamorphon. It means transformation. This is what it means. This is very powerful. It says, as I look into the mirror, something happens to me. See, in the mirror, I see myself perfected. In the mirror, I'm full of glory. I'll give an example. On this part of town, I'm struggling. I can't raise the money. In the mirror, I have the money. In the mirror, all things are possible unto me. In the mirror, I see myself doing big things. But here, my reality, I'm not doing those big things I see in the mirror. So what do I do? The Bible says that as we behold, as we continue to look, 
he didn't say as we pray as we continue to meditate in what we see in the mirror he said there's something about looking into the mirror that changes our being my god my god my god praise god I want to say it again. I'm at a stage in my life. I'm depressed. Things are not working. That's how I look. When I look at the mirror, you know what I see? It didn't say I will see myself the way I am. It said I will see myself in the glory of God. I see myself, but in the mirror when I see myself, I see myself fulfilled. I see myself joyful. I see myself expanding. So what does the apostle say? The apostle says the way I'm going to change where I am is to keep what looking in the mirror. So he says, but we all with open faces beholding us in the glass, the glory of God, are changed, glory to God, and changed into that same image. How do I change who I am? By looking at the mirror. What does looking at the mirror mean? It means meditation. It means what? meditation thank you holy spirit what's meditation how many of you have watched a movie action movie or scary movie and at night the movie showed up in your dream wave your hands let me see you know what just happened to you meditation that was meditation you 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 watched the movie so much that the movie moved into oh wow Somebody say hallelujah. You watched the movie so much that what was not real became real in your life. You watched the movie so much that they were fighting Shaolin Master. Oh, you know, all of a sudden you are sleeping, then your wife notices you going, ha! He, ho, ho. I, 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 honey, what's wrong? The movie had moved into your life. What happens is this. When you look at the word, it's only word. Though. In the word, you see God has met your needs. In the word, you see that you have the baby. In the word, you see you have the husband. In the word, you see you have the healing. You meditate on it so much that when you come back to physical life, what was in the word begins to show up in your life. Are you getting me right now? So all of a sudden you are responding, who, 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 who? The word goes, what's happening? Meditation. You have brought the spiritual reality into the physical reality. Someone say hallelujah. He says the way we are changed from glory to glory is by beholding. It's by beholding. Listen to me. Be careful what you look at. Because what you look at will enter your life. I'm telling you, what will you look at will enter your life. I'm not sure, you know, um, look at today now. Today, our oldest church member, Mama, she's 100 years old. After service came and said, I was not meant to come to church today because I meant to go back to my place, which is, I think, the village. He said, but I told him I must come to church to come and wish you a happy, year, happy birthday. And, and someone, said, ah, someone said, you love Mama a lot. And I said, the reason why I love her is this. This is the way I want to think about my 100 years life. The most people that I know that are 80 years old. And if you're not careful, when you think of your future, that's how you think of yourself. So when you see something that looks like what you want, go for it. Celebrate it. Glory to God. I said glory to God. Why? The more we behold, the more we become. The more we behold, the more we become. The more we behold, what happens? The more we become. Let me tell you what I began to do. And I wanted to pay, all of you in the choir, please pay attention. When I was younger, finances were quite tough. You know what I did? I would take a pen and write a check and put it in my room. All the checks I've written what happened then one time i wrote one check and i thought this was too big i remember when i removed the check and i said ah, ah. it was too big when i wrote it 
but the check is not too small. Why? What you behold, you become. You know the problem? I know you want to marry, but have you beheld your marriage? I know you want to, I want, you want a million dollars. Have you beheld it? Because meditation is that it will sink into your subconscious. Let me show you some examples of meditation. Are you there? Numbers chapter. Numbers. And, and, and you know one of the reasons why you have to look at the mirror is this. I, I said this earlier, but I'm going to say it again. One of the reasons why you have to keep looking at the mirror is this. You don't, one of the most painful things that can ever happen to someone is to go through life and all people meet is the damaged version of you. And I'm saying so because a lot of people, when you see them talk and behave, that's not how they were. They were damaged by life. And what you are seeing is the damaged version. Have you seen a phone that is broken before? When someone has never seen phone before, when he sees a broken phone, the person may assume that's how the phone came originally. And it will not know it was broken. A lot of people that you think or you meet, what you have met is the damaged version. And how do you know? I'll give a story. There were some people that came to me for counseling and this couple had come. And um, what was the problem? They were, they were, marriage was struggling. Then I discovered during the counseling that it was the father of the wife that disvirgined the wife. And the man had been sleeping with her since when she was maybe seven or eight, something like that. And because they were literally mostly girls in that family, the man was also sleeping with the other daughters. So to make their father not sleep with the other girls, you know what she did? She used to pull the father towards her so that at least it would be her alone that is defiled. The boyfriend told me, he said that twice I did a portion for her because her father got her pregnant. I said, what's the problem now? The problem now is that they had a big marital problem. And the wife says, I will go back to my father because at least he treats me better. And this is what I'm saying to you. This is why you must make sure that what people experience in your life is not the damaged version of you. This is the reason why. You can be so used to damage and abuse that you'll find yourself returning to a place of damage and abuse. Because you don't know what it means to stay in a place of safety and security. And that lady, when I spoke to her, what eventually happened to her is this. She was so used to damage and abuse, she found herself returning there. And that's why sometimes you will find that people that abuse eventually become abusers. But what can fix a man is that a man gets God's word and meditates in God's word and shifts mental boundaries. Because what has happened to you? Someone says, so why do people go back to the abuse? And let me, let's be honest. Some of you are here, man. You saw your mother beating by your father. You swore you will never touch a woman. You are not married. You are still beating your girlfriend. The reason why is that you don't become what you want. You become what you're exposed to. You were exposed to damage and you were damaged. Now you are older, you are damaged again. You are not only damaged, you are damaging other people. And the way you're going to come out of that is that you are going to have to fix it. And fixing it means that certain mental shifts must happen. And such mental shift must happen because you are exposing yourself to new things. And this is what will happen. How do you become damaged? You were exposed to something. How do you heal your damage? You have to be exposed to something else. Can we talk here? There are people that want love and sincerely when they see love, they don't know how to respond. I spoke to a girl one time. And she said, when a man loves me, I just become afraid. And I asked her, have you been loved before by your father or your mother? He said that my father ran away when I was young. My mother died when I was early. I can never say anybody has loved me before. I said, that's the problem. Because you don't know what love is, it's like someone speaking French to you. You will not know how to respond. Although you desire it, when you eventually find it, you will spoil it. 
And that's why people, you see them moving from here to there. The, the lady said, what should I do? I said, what you have to do is this. We have to put you in an environment where you become exposed to love so that you can what? So that you can know what love is and, and what respond appropriately. So I said, what do you mean? This was the thing that happened to Moses. God understood Moses was meant to be the deliverer. But if Moses was raised as a slave, a slave cannot raise another slave. So what God did was to use a system to raise Moses in the palace so that he would not have the mentality of a slave and come back to rescue them. Can I be honest with you? That's why some of you, your journey in your family, God took you out of it. The reason why is that if you were raised in that home like the others, the damage that happened to them would happen to you again. So he raised you through the backside. And you know the thing? When God finished with Moses and raised him, Moses became a warrior. And so, as they talk about Israel, he killed them. God says, training is not complete. The reason why is that you've learned what it means to be a warrior to fight. But it takes a shepherd's heart. So what? To release them. So, you know what God did? God sent him to Midian, where he became a shepherd. Because he needed to develop a shepherd's heart. Once you understand what God is doing in your life, you will not cause some things delay again. You call them preparation. So when you see the journey of Moses, you think he was wasting time. No. God was raising a shepherd out of him. That was why when he came back, he couldn't understand how they were still in Israel because his thinking was different. Because it was raised differently. You just wonder, why you didn't want to go to this church? You're not going to a family church. And the reason why is that God is raising you differently. And so, ah, he's raising you differently. And it's until you bring them out before they know what has happened to them. Because it's difficult for a slave to set a slave free. Praise God. So what God does is that in his own wisdom, once he wants to step into your life, he will create a system for you to come out of that place, expose you to something else because it's another exposure you need that will change your mindset. You can go back into the system and do something else. Can we talk? Ladies, can I talk to you? There are ladies here, by the training you have, for you to do something significant in life, men must give you money. And that money will come through sexual help. And it's somewhere there. And what God will do for you is to take you to the backside of the desert when no man will help you. You will think that God is trying to damage you. No. No. Except the corn of wheat dies, it abides alone. You must die to the old way of thinking for a new way to emerge. If you can survive it, you will come out and understand that I don't have to sell my body to make it in life. Once you do that, what will happen to you is that as you do it, it will not be a testimony for yourself again. Even your sisters and friends will see it because you become the door, you become the porter that opens the door for others to do. Can I be honest with you? Let me hear this and hear this well. Every family and community needs someone that has done it. What? Every family and community needs somebody that has done what nobody could have done before to show them what is available to all. And my prayer is that that person will be you. Where well, you can come out and say, listen to me, I swear and you don't have to swear, but I'm just using the figurative word. I say, I, I tell the truth with everything within me. I'm a lady. I never slept around to get what I had. It was a grace of God and work. And you look at your sister and say, that all the time you have lived with me, which man did this? I said, nobody. And you tell her and said, if this happened to me, it can happen to you. That is what I call the potter's testimony. What's the potter's testimony? Where you don't just have a testimony, but you use your testimony to open the doors for other people to cross. And you must be that person that others can't cross. But let me warn you, the person that must part the way, his head will have bruises. That's why you're running away. Because you want to part the way, but you don't want your head to have bruises. The one that must part the way, his head will have bruises. But the one that passed the way, eventually when the way is parted, everybody will remember it was him that parted the way for us. The prayer you must pray is this. That the word of God will change your mind in such a way that you will become a pathfinder in your family. Stand on your feet. Let us pray.
Can you listen to this? All of you that are running away from hardship, stop running. The reason why is this. Sometimes, the hardship you experience is not meant to destroy you, it's meant to prepare you. The hardship you experience is meant to activate certain gifts inside you. What I've learned is that there are certain gifting that will never be activated except in hard conditions. So stop running away because in running away, you become underdeveloped. Release yourself so that the gifts can rise up. And when the gift rises up, it's over. Stop running away from hardship. The hardship is not meant to kill you. The hardship is meant to activate what? A gift inside you. As long as Joseph was in his father's house, his gift could not matter. It was when Joseph got into hardship that his gift jumped up. Daniel, Shadrach, and Mesh, Abednego. It was when their gift got into hardship that it matter. It is in tough times that stars arise. So tough times doesn't kill people, it's the stars that arise. Stop running away from tough seasons. It's time for the star in you to emerge. Praise God. I want you to go ahead and pray. Go ahead and pray. Go ahead and pray. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise and glory and praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And Father, we thank you. I'm praying that everyone here will be given to the word of God in such a way that it will change their mentality. I'm praying that everyone here will receive the anointing to be a pathfinder. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Relentless, relentless towards the purpose of your high calling. In Jesus' mighty name. Receive the grace to be a pathfinder. Receive a grace to be a potter in your family. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will not back down because of hardship. You will find a way to win. And through your testimony, you will open the door for other people. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your testimony with that God did it for me. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Were you blessed by that? That word is specifically for those running away from hardship. Those running away from hardship, please pay attention. Those that are saying that, God, this is too hard. This is too painful. Why is my life so hard? Pay attention. Because this is for you. Praise God.